thank you very much, uh, Africa. Uh, greetings to all present and greetings to everybody uh, following the presentation of, of this report in the various uh, media. Uh, today uh, it is indeed a great opportunity for our office to be presenting the work that we have done on the government packages that were announced by President uh, Cyril Ramaphosa in April. All of us will recall the President saying that he does not want a lot of this money that was set aside for relief of various communities, of various social and economic uh, packages to go to waste and called upon us as an audit office to bring forth our skills and to assist the country in making sure that we go into these environments as early as possible so that we don't wait another 16 months before we can pronounce on what has happened or is currently happening with regards to the COVID funds. As all will recognize uh, the fact that our Public Audit Act does provide for a special engagement to be undertaken by our office, as well as to issue a special report that must be tabled in the National Assembly. And I am sure that as we conclude this engagement, this report will also be available on the table in the National Assembly. We coined this report the first special report on the financial management of government's COVID-19 initiatives, which means that uh, we are reporting on the audit work that we have performed in relation to the management of these finances as they were set up in the budgets around COVID-19 in June. To kick off the detail of this report, we thought that let us give the 500 billion package its true breakdown in terms of what was intended to be done with it. And here we go firstly. A couple of components that made up this whole 500 billion is important to set up front. And we will recognize that there was a 70 billion that is part of this 500. That was referred to as temporary tax relief, such as tax deferrals and postponement of some payment to South African Revenue Service. This 70 billion because of its nature, because of what was intended with it, has not been included in the report for purposes of this audit. Because South African Revenue Service has almost provided a lifeline to taxpayers to assist them during the lockdown period, to utilize some of the monies that they have collected on behalf of our South African Revenue Service, to meet some of their short-term financial needs with a view to subsequently paying this money into SARS. So we looked at this 70 billion and were of the view that the South African Revenue Service has got sufficient controls and disciplines in place to make sure that it can on its own track how this 70 billion has been utilized by any taxpayer that was allowed to delay submission of the monies collected on behalf of SARS. As an audit office, as is customary with the work that we do, we will also perform follow-up audit procedures when we audit the books of South African Revenue Service so that we can give assurance to what and how this 70 billion has been managed in the context of this COVID package. <clears throat> the second component of these funds is a 200 billion 
which was referred to as a credit guarantee scheme, a scheme that was aimed at providing bank loans guaranteed by government to eligible businesses. Again, this 200 billion for purposes of our report is excluded because it is managed directly between the borrowers and the banks with National Treasury and the South African Reserve Bank providing whatever government has agreed will be provided in order to facilitate access to this 200 billion. Hence, it does not form part of the detail that we have audited. We believe that the banks on their own, together with the Reserve Bank and National Treasury, have got sufficient tools to track who borrowed, on what terms, and what the repayment criteria and terms are going to be. So we left it out because we are confident that those institutions have what it takes to make the necessary decisions in terms of the eligibility for this funding, as well as the recovery of this funding after those commitments and agreements have been made between the banks and the lenders. So as we begin this exercise as an audit office, out of this 500 billion, the amount that is subjected to our scrutiny is therefore the balance of 230 billion. And I think it's important to make sure that all of us are on the same page because it is true that the narrative is around the entire 500 billion. But 270 of this 500 billion was never intended to flow through the departments and agencies of government, as I have explained. So what is contained in our report, therefore, as of today, is with respect to the work that we have done on the rest of the 230 billion. Again, in that 230 billion, there was 40 billion that was identified for wage protection. And this was exclusively funded from the existing reserves of the Unemployment Insurance Fund. So government decided to tap into the balance sheet of the, of the uh, Unemployment Insurance Fund in order to provide relief to employees and employers <clears throat> during the period of this COVID-19 period. And that was to the extent of 40 billion, which leaves us with a balance of 190 billion. In this 190 billion, the Minister of Finance tabled on the 22nd of June what is called an adjustments budget. An adjustment budget that was made up of reprioritized funding from existing budgets during the course of this year, together with some loan funding that was going to patch up those areas of this 190 that were not capable of being funded from existing government resources. And of course, the Minister of Finance, when the, the tabled this adjustments budget, which has subsequently been approved by Parliament, tabled a total amount of 145 billion. And the balance of the other 45 remaining will be appropriated in subsequent budgets. They did say that it may well happen during the medium term budget policy statement in October or during the annual budget in February in 2021. And so when we look closer at this 145 billion that has now been formally approved through the adjustments process in Parliament, we must also remember that the balance of 45 out of the 190 is yet to be appropriated. So it is not therefore subject of this exercise. 
this exercise in terms of the audit report of our institution for this COVID-19 audit is predominantly in respect of 145 billion outside as a component of that entire 500 billion. And this 145 billion, when it was approved in Parliament in June, was split into different components. And on the slides here, we do have all of the items that this 145 billion was made up of. And for those that have a calculator that is reliable enough, they can surely add all these items and they will find them to add up exactly 245 billion rands. Meaning that the audit work that we have done has strictly followed the money that was made available for relief, both social and economic relief, around the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. It is split into a 40.9 billion set aside to support vulnerable households. <clears throat> it is that 40.9 billion budget, you will recognize that it has got three elements to it. The one element was for food parcels right at the beginning of the COVID lockdown and we'll give some detail of what was spent in respect of food parcels coming out of the 40.9 billion. Another component of it was a budget for the social relief of distress grant of 350 rands for those people who qualify for it. And then another component again which is included in this 40.9 billion is with respect to what is called the top-up grant of 500 and for 250 for others who have been clearly defined in the legislative instruments that provided for this 40.9 billion. So our work was to track how this 40.9 billion has been dispersed in respect to those three elements. The second one in terms of this budget of the 145 was another 21.54 billion, which was earmarked for health related expenditure. There was a 20 set aside for support to municipalities. Other frontline services which are broken down very clearly in our report are also budgeted for here in terms of the 13.6 billion. Basic and higher education also received based on this budget, 12.5. Small and informal business support as well as job creation and job protection, another 6.06 .06 billion. Support to public entities, other COVID interventions, and equity investment set aside to support land bank, as well as another provisional set of allocations adding up to 19.58 billion. All of those, almost 10 components, make up this 145 billion. Substantive work has been done on it, and our report contains exactly the work that the Audit Office has been doing in the last two to three months. Right at the beginning, as we were getting closer to determining the extent of work that we were going to, to, to do in respect of this ex exercise. We identified something that we as an audit office have been preoccupied with for quite some time in our audit reports for both the PFMA and the MFMA. And we reached out with all our teams during the time of the lockdown to the accounting officers and accounting authorities and executive authorities of the respective departments that were going to be charged with spending this money. Let us remember that it is the 145 that is part of this budget, as well as the other 40, which came directly from the direct funding of the UIF. We reached out to the accounting officers and said, it will be very important and useful for all of you as accounting officers 
to gear up your preventative controls. And these preventative controls are those types of controls that enable somebody who is entrusted with managing other people's money to put in place the necessary controls to prevent anybody, internal or external, from finding it easy to divert this money away from what was intended. Some accounting officers responded positively, others did not. And the report spells out very clearly instances where our council was not heeded. But it is a very important principle because it allows an accounting officer to know upfront what is likely to go wrong and what measures ought to be taken in order to prevent that which could lead to disaster in terms of this money. And so our council was initi initiated in an environment where there were lots and lots of emergencies and emergency decisions that needed to be made. But that is not new. All disaster situations often require emergency. But emergency, once the new rules have been set out, ought to come with preventative tactics so that we can make up for the exposure that we now have to contend with when we manage public funds. A practical example of this is, if in a department there used to be 12 people under normal operating conditions who are supposed to handle documentation, procurement, processing of transactions, reconciliations of books, if that situation changes and suddenly you are only able to do with three because many others are on lockdown, then you've got to dig deep as an accounting officer and find those other controls that will enable you to prevent significant losses being incurred when you only are working with three instead of 12 people. Because now suddenly other nine people are no longer around to do that which could protect these funds. So that was a strategy that we adopted. But we knew that not everybody is going to respond positively to this council. We then prepared ourselves as an audit office to go in after they've done the processing month on month and say, let us now see through the detection tools that we have as an audit office as to whether you have been able to identify those high risk areas, whether you have been able to put in place what we could often refer to as an invincible fortress around the management of these public funds. And the purpose of this report is to give feedback to the country on how we have experienced these environments in respect to the detection that comes with the audit. And the last stage of the whole process that we were involved with was the reporting. We have committed ourselves to report as we are doing now. This is our first report. There is going to be a second report that comes. We hope that by the end of November, we would have released the second report. And I think as we go through the presentation, we will see how useful that follow-up report is going to be because a lot of the effort that we put into this on the detection side of things has revealed a number of frightening findings that require to be followed up very quickly so that there is no significant passage of time before the required actions are implemented. It is important to note that when you have to commit to a detection strategy in terms of scrutinizing the records of any institution, you can't just rely on accountants. They are an important part of the equation. We had to dig deep into our own environment and found many of our experts that we often use on our audits, not with the same level of rigor as we have applied in this case. Because we came here before the end of the financial year. 
as things were cooking, if I may put it that way. And we almost kind of said, can you please taste while you're busy so that we can make sure that you are doing that which is required of you. But we won't disrupt you because we know how urgent some of the things that you need to procure are. So we brought forward our data analysts. We brought forward our fraud experts, our supply chain management specialists, our information technology auditors, our performance auditors, many of whom have expertise in the health sector. We've used them in analyzing our sector reports in health, in education, as well as those that are trained in infrastructure disciplines who are part of our performance audit unit at the Auditor General. So this was a multidisciplinary team effort that did not just rely on somebody delivering an invoice to you, but it relied on expertise that, is, that are able to go very deep into areas where, shall I say, eagles dare. And they went in and scrutinized the disbursements to beneficiaries, comparing different databases of government to ensure that the rules that have been set out for the beneficiaries that had come forward to claim what they were asked to come forward and claim for. We managed to get into these disbursement records and interrogated the data and compared the different databases. If it was a home affairs database, we managed to look at SARS. We managed to look at SASA's database so that we can identify whether there are no instances, for example, of double dipping or somebody claiming different types of benefits. And we will show later on when we deal with the findings of this audit, how we have fared in that environment. Because it's often true that the opportunity to commit fraudulent activity in any environment, whether it is in the private sector or whether it is in the public sector, a lot of that fraud activity, when we look at our fraud risk management strategies, is often prompted by instances where there's an opportunity an opportunity for fraudulent behavior arises when the disciplines of internal control have been weakened. In this case, that's what we have observed. That when there are fewer people who are able to monitor and supervise transactions, others who know best take the opportunity. But also others rationalize the behavior by saying that I was hungry, I needed to pay for A, B, C, and D, and therefore there was a rationalization for behaving the way I did. Others have got pressures, they could be financial pressures, or any other pressure that persuades them to do that which they would not otherwise do. So in looking at what role all of these experts were going to play in scrutinizing these funds, we relied on our understanding of the interface between those people who will be in the front line processing transactions when many were absent, as well as how they interface with the systems. And also the fraud and the information technology scrutiny was largely aimed at identifying those instances. And so because of this scrutiny, as well as the level of work we have done, We've also decided that the data that we have extracted, which points to pointed risks of potential fraudulent activity in many of these transactions, will be passed on to the multi-agency fusion center, which is a group of institutions across the country that are charged with the responsibility to pursue instances of fraud and corruption investigation related to COVID-19. And we believe that those people have what it takes. They've got the skills, they've got the tools, and they've got the statutory mandate to take those matters that raised our level of suspicion 
as an audit office to a next level so that they can be able to attach the requisite consequences should they come to a conclusion that our initial suspicions as auditors have been proven. Let's deal very quickly with the key initiatives that I had spoken to earlier on. You will see on the slide here that we have grouped these initiatives into what government ultimately broke down into the different budgets. You'll note that the amount in brown, I don't know if it's red on your side, but it's brown on me, is the amount that was budgeted in total for that particular package. The description of that which was being paid for is what we show in the narrative on that slide. For example, the support to vulnerable households was budgeted to the extent of 41 billion rands at the beginning. Up to the end of July, that is exactly a month ago, South African Social Security Agency had already spent 19.7 billion towards three components. First component, in the initial period in May, they bought and paid for food parcels. That total expenditure they incurred up to that period was 177 million rands, which is included in that 19.7. Then they spent 15.2 billion rands of that 19.7 towards the top up. Remember, the social grant database has got somewhere around 17 million beneficiaries, of which 12 were the ones that had qualified for that top up because it was based also on per caregiver as was clarified at the beginning. That amounted to the total top up payment which is included in the report and there's a very clear and detailed analysis of that top up payment from the beginning of this benefit up to and including the 31st of July. Sasa had dispersed physically 15.2 billion rands. And then the 350 grant, which is also included there, made up another balance of just about 4.4 billion rands. 350 grant, 4.4 billion rands over three months, paying for an average of about 4 million individuals. So there were 4.2 million individuals in May, about 3.9 million individuals in June, because they keep cleaning up their database month on month, and somewhere around another average of 4 million individuals in June, in July, sorry. So it's May, June, and July included. All those three components, if you add them up, they give you 19.7 billion rands. That suggests that for the period from August onwards up to the end of this benefit, which was set as October, we still have another say close to 21, 22 billion yet to be spent. It has not left the bank. The balance between the budget of 41 and the 19.7 is still sitting in the bank account. The wage protection, which was the money that was set out to pay for the terrorist relief fund for COVID activities, as I said in the initial slide, it was a full budget of 40 billion rands coming from the existing reserves of the UIF. Up to the end of July, the UIF had physically dispersed 37 billion rands. So from August onwards, they were left with 2.8 billion rands yet to be spent. As we know, there was an extension to the benefit of tariffs for various reasons which were communicated by the Minister of Labour. But of that 40, from what we have scrutinized in the records, they had only spent, which is agreed to the accounting records, 37 billion rands. And so there were many other benefits that were set aside, which we show on the slide, which follow 
a similar pattern. Whether, whether you're looking at the farmer's relief, which was money put aside to provide relief to those that are in the farming sector. Sports, arts and culture, which was also another social relief fund, with a very insignificant uptake up to the end of July. And the report will give proper narrative as to what was behind some of the delays in picking up what was intended to be benefited by sports, arts and culture people across the country. There was also a tourism relief fund which was set aside to provide relief to those people who are doing their business in the tourism sector. The ministry worked very closely with South African tourism to disperse these 200 uh, uh, million rands of uh, tourism relief. And at the end of July, almost all of it had been allocated. We provide analysis in the report as to which areas got what and what number of individuals were supported. With regards to this tourism relief, you will recall that it was meant to be 50,000 rands per qualifying beneficiary. And there were about 4,000 of those that were supported through this fund. And if you multiply the two, you'll find that uh, the department did indeed allocate fully that which was given to it. There was also money set aside to small businesses. For those people that wanted to get some debt relief, as well as money that was made available for people who run spaza shops right at the beginning of the hard lockdown, who were also provided support in respect of this. So of the budget of 1.76, billion of support to small businesses up to the end of June because we couldn't get all the information up to the end of July but we thought we will settle for that which we have which was up to the end of June it was about 151 million which means that in so far as that project is concerned there's still another huge 1.6 billion that is yet to be spent come July, August, September, and whenever it goes into the future. There were also identified loans through the Industrial Development Corporation. Up to the July period, nothing out of that 2.5 billion had been spent. Uh, there were a few uh, submissions and applications, but the Industrial Development Corporation is handling any one of those as they come. But in essence, what it means is that those that had come forward had not been approved for payment. That's why there has not yet been any payment arising from the ITC. The compensation fund, which is one of those that uh, provides for claims for those that are affected due to disability, illness, or death resulting from occupational injuries, uh, no specific budget was put aside, but we do know that further down the line there will be claims that will need to be processed. But up to so far, there was just about 400,000 that had come forth <clears throat> for that claim. The one interesting area which has attracted public engagement over a number of weeks and months now was the area of procurement. Health services, healthcare services is that one. Budget of 22.4 billion. As we go through the accounting records of government, specifically that procurement which was going to be funded out of this 500 billion, we were able to confirm that 6.47 billion is the actual expenditure that has hit the accounting records. Not all of that 22.4 has been spent yet, in so far as the healthcare services are concerned. We've looked at different departments, and I'm sure there are many departments that used the funding that was available to them outside of this 500 billion, who have gone forth to spend on it. It's not included here, for example, because we are going to be dealing with that as part of our ongoing statutory audit which is on the go now. So we're gonna be isolating some of those 
items that were spent on COVID in various departments and deal with them both in national, provincial, and local government institutions as part of the statutory audit. That's why you see this 6.47 billion looks like it's not too huge. But you will recall when the SIU reported, they were saying that they are chasing somewhere around 5.2 billion of procurement expenditure. So we think that we have the bulk of that in this particular healthcare services expenditure, which we are going to interface with the fusion center where the SIU also plays a part to compare notes and to share our insights and observations and findings with regards to matters that we have identified. And listening loud to what was pronounced in the public domain and having done our own analysis of the procurement processes and deficiencies in procurement, we think that there's some level of convergence between the full extent of the amounts that the SIU is chasing versus the things that we have seen as we are doing our own analysis. Further on, the report has got detailed matters that I'm sure I'll also deal with in the findings section of my presentation. Then there's money that was set aside for support to municipalities. Coincidentally, when this package was announced, there was a huge outcry as to the need for rigorous steps to be taken to make sure that this money does not lend itself to environments that have got broken systems. And you can see that there's about 23.9 billion that was budgeted to provide support to all municipalities across the country, whether it is metros, district municipalities, or local municipalities. But you will know that the bulk of that 23.9 billion has not yet been passed on to the municipalities. Only about 1.6 billion up to the end of June had been passed on to municipalities to provide them some breathing space in the meantime. The reason for this non-transfer was largely some work that National Treasury had to do to make sure that they put in place the necessary disciplines and the necessary facilities that will be needed in order for municipalities to know the parameters within which this particular package of funds should be spent. So in our analysis, we, we do know that there's a 20 billion that is still sitting at National Treasury, which has not been sent out to those municipalities because National Treasury also had to be responsive to our council to say to them that make sure that as you are preparing to send this money down to local government institutions, you wrap it around with things that you as National Treasury can monitor so that if expenditure goes away from what was intended, you can then be in a position to be pointed in identifying that which can potentially be abused. So clearly in municipalities, that whole 20 billion, which was a worry, has not yet left the bank account that is controlled <clears throat> by National Treasury. On the defense frontline services was a budget. Again, as we all know that the South African National Defense had a role that it played in the entire project. Of the 4.297 billion that was put aside as a budget, to meet some of the activities that those deployed soldiers were going to carry out, only about 1.1 of that 4.2 had been spent up to the date of this report. Basic education interventions which required procurement again of personal protective equipment for learners, education and support staff was also another emergency funding set aside for 5.2 billion budget of which only 1389 had been spent up to the date of this report. <clears throat> A 
and then a few other areas, quarantine sites. I'm sure all of us know that they were part of the preparation for what was expected to be a worst uh, outcome. And many of those had not really attracted as much of that expenditure, but for the elements that had already been paid for through public works, as well as the property management trading entity, in coordination with many departments like the Department of Health, only about 581 million of that 3.1 had up to the end of July been spent. And there was some element of expenditure for expanded public works programs. Not a significant portion of it has gone towards the expanded public work program as intended. Emergency supply of water to targeted communities. That was a project that was about delivering the Georgia tanks and making sure that they are installed in various communities, as well as engaging the services of watering, water tankering uh, companies to fill up the tanks, as well as the temporary residential unit support program. Very little of the money set aside had been spent by the 30th of June. And I think it is worth pointing here that there are a combination of reasons for some of this expenditure not having gone out as fast as it could have. Part of it is to do with the fact that the global value chains, including the local value chains, had to go uh, to rest in the first period of this lockdown. And so the pickup of some of this activity would obviously be expected in periods subsequent to the end of July. It's not necessarily savings, but it's also a reflection of the inefficiencies in the processing of some of these activities in some departments. So, but I think it is good to know that of the total that has been set aside, as I've spoken to, which was the, the overall budget, which is included now in this analysis, it comes to somewhere around 147 billion. If you already have access to the full report, you will see the very specific detail associated with each of these items on page 22 and page 23 of the COVID-19 report as we have released today. But I'm also able to confirm <clears throat> that of the funds that were set aside as I have analyzed them earlier, the actual expenditure that has come through up to the end of July adding up all of the components that I spoke to just now is 68.8 billion in total. That's what our government has spent up to the end of July. <clears throat> and you will recognize that in this total 68 billion, there was 37 for UIF and there was just about close to 20 for social uh, relief. That gives us a total of about 57 billion. So we are saying in this report, 57 billion of the 68 that has been spent cumulatively to the end of July was in respect to the two programs of UIF as well as the SASA relief projects, which means that the rest of the other programs together with procurement have taken up just about 11 billion in total. If you take that 57 plus the 11 gives us the total 68 total expenditure that has been incurred up to the end of July. I think it is very important to make sure that message uh, sinks in with all of us because we have used our auditing tools to get to this number. What it tells us is that where we missed the bus in respect of raising the level of preventative controls as a country, we still have an opportunity to the extent of the balance of close to another 70 billion which is yet to be spent from the beginning of August onwards. And I'm sure the leaders of government will pronounce on 
what those areas of priority are because some of them were set aside for relief for small businesses and the economy and other things. But as an audit office, we do not venture into the analysis of what that will be like. All we are able to say is not all that was sitting in the bank account has been given away to other people because we can confirm for the end of July that up to 68 billion of the 147 that was a subject of scrutiny for these funds taking into account the 70 and the 200 that are being dealt with elsewhere <clears throat> and considering the fact that the other 45 billion of the 190 is yet to be appropriated from October onwards. I've got a table here which is the one I referred to which then gives you an opportunity to see in specific detail how all of these elements add up together in respect of that which was budgeted, in respect of that which is specifically included in this audit, in respect of what has been spent to date, as well as what remains from the 1st of August. Let me just take a step at an, uh, the fourth item on this table. And that is the one that's reading support to municipalities. Based on the budget, we've got 20 billion. And you'll see that at the bottom of this page, there's another 3.2, which will give you that 23 I spoke about earlier on. That 20 billion was budgeted. We included it in the analysis of this budget, 2034. And up to the end of July, there was zero expenditure in respect to that 20 billion because national treasury still has this money under its control and that's why we are saying that at least that part of the money has not yet gone where it was intended so this particular table which we call the table of funding and expenditure will give you the specific elements and the and the expenditure against them as we have audited and you will note that all of these that are under the budget line add up to the 500 billion because in order for clarity's sake as well as to run with this 500 billion narrative we needed to bring back some of the items that we said are not included like the 70 and the 200 so that we can see the 500 for what it is and understand the key elements that make up that whole 500 billion so that's where we are in terms of the very specific 500 billion and against it you'll note that we spent about 65.9 and when you go straight to the next page there were there was a couple of other additional budgets that were set aside on top of that 500 all of which added up to the 11 point the 11.4 uh, billion in to, on top of the 500 and all that was spent against it was about 2.96. That's how we get the full 68 billion I spoke about. It is in the report. It is on page 22 and page 23 of that report for those that want to follow the analysis of how it all builds up and adds up to that which we ended up with as an audit office. Hence, we are confidently saying that north of 70 billion as at the end of July. And as confirmed through the accounting records in the basic accounting system of government, there is still 78 billion yet to be spent. <clears throat> That's the money. What did we observe? We observed that this rapid implementation as expected was lending this money in some environments that were significantly compromised with regards to the systems of internal control. And therefore, the risk was multiplied. Secondly, when we looked at the information technology systems of government, they were not responsive enough to take care of these new monies as they were going to be filtered through government systems. So we find information system technology environments that were weak. 
We also found pre-existing deficiencies in supply chain processes. This is not new. This is what we have always reported on as an audit office over the years. We didn't expect that the invoking of the COVID lockdown was suddenly going to get all of that to disappear because all of us over the more than a decade are still grappling with the disciplines of looking after procurement of goods and services, not being strong in our government. Hence the narratives that have been going around in respect of procurement of goods and services at prices much higher than what National Treasury had prescribed. The poor record keeping has also been a feature in terms of this. You would almost think that if something was spent in the last two to three months, the people that were responsible for that expenditure will still remember where that particular record is. But there were many instances where the auditors got a run around trying to figure out where is this particular document that supports a particular transaction. So those are some of the observations that we made as we were going through the scrutiny of these records. As well as the pre-existing inability to coordinate and oversee efforts that require and involve multiple departments and agencies. How does this show itself out? You'll see it in the findings. You go into SASA, you send our electronic scrutiny tools to the database, and you are hoping that SASA would have done that as a preliminary test to identify people that are being paid off out of SASA to check whether they have not also received, for example, UIF. These are the instances we are talking about, where one government department does not utilize the other available government databases to get assurance that they are not getting tripped with making payments that may not necessarily be due to some of those beneficiaries that have raised their hand. <clears throat> and therefore the data analysis that we have done across all of these systems has pointed to us that there is still a prevalence of a high risk of fraud and abuse to these funds if the requisite steps are not taken. And that is why we believe that the multi-agency fusion center will become a very useful tool to get to the depths of these items because as auditors, we do not have that necessary set of tools to achieve that particular objective as it were. But it is good that there's a agency of many institutions that will take on board these matters, add them to the list of other items they already have so that they can give the country proper feedback as to what has happened to those matters that we have identified in our analysis. Here are some of the very specific findings associated with some of the specific areas of expenditure. For example, in the UIF environment for the first lockdown period, we've identified some overpayments because the period of, in of inactivity was not taken into account in determining the payment that was supposed to be made to the employers. We've given this to the UIF people and asked them to scrutinize at the lists that we have extracted from their databases and give us explanations for why the amounts they have paid are the way they are. Should they remain the same? or should they begin to identify recovery of these overpayments. <clears throat> We've also done some recalculations which identified a combination of overpayments, underpayments, duplicate payments, and discrepancies such as payment approval made before the date of application. And that's what the information technology scrutiny audit techniques has assisted us because you can't ask for something like this and someone gives you a report. You can only identify it when you go in there where it is there and pick it up yourself. Ask the question. If there's a plausible explanation for it, you then settle for whatever that is. If not, you push ahead and, and not accept the fact that there are overpayments that cannot be explained. 
Because a compromised internal control environment does not only create an opportunity for people in the external environment to try their chance, it also creates an opportunity internally for those that process transactions to fiddle around because they know that the scrutiny that comes with the normal systems of internal control is not in place. And of course, on the social grant side, with respect to the 350 relief of social uh, distress, there was no doubt a need for also scrutinizing this particular area because people were submitted to submit their ID numbers via any media. It could be an SMS, it could be anything, because there was no system in place at SASA that would have taken care of this special uh, uh, grant. And we used our same audit uh, techniques, information technology ones, to look at areas of vulnerability of this new system that was developed. Because there are clever people out there who can access an information technology system from far away, from a different place. They can hack in and they can put in some dodgy numbers into the system and then the people sitting in the department are no wiser what is happening in the electronic environment if they didn't put in the right level of scrutiny. However, our data analytics that we used also to scrutinize all of the records of the four million odd people that were in this database, we identified that somewhere around over 30,000 beneficiaries require further investigation. Uh, for example, among these are people working in government and recipients of UIF payments and other social grants and government pension that also picked up a benefit in respect of this 350. We believe that it was not intended for people like those. <clears throat> Another example that we used when we spoke about the need for preventative controls was that how do you prevent somebody who is a student above the age of 18 who is not employed and does not appear on the UIF database, does not appear on SARS, and is not also on NSFAS because they are privately funded. That particular person can walk scot-free into the 350 benefit database. However, the question is, was it intended? for a person like that, because they are students privately funded, but according to the rules that have been set here, they can also be eligible for this. So this can run into millions of people and millions of rents sometimes if the necessary controls are not put in place. And uh, one other observation, right at the beginning when the top up was processed, you will recall that a lot of this change that needed to be put through the system to accommodate this extra 500 for old age people and children could not be completed on time. And then in the grant payment for May, there was also a lot of manual work around with few controls around the system to protect what was being input. And so there were duplicate payments and some beneficiaries not receiving their grants. I think it was widely reported already in May, but we got assurance when we arrived and did this work at SASA, and we identified that a lot of these cases were subsequently corrected. And I think that is the attitude that we take to say that when you have slipped up on a particular internal control, there's always an opportunity to correct and correct course, because if you don't, we are then going to linger on with all these inappropriate payments for another six months, and that might take away from the fiscal's and pay towards people who were not the real intended beneficiaries. <clears throat> We've got some findings also in respect to the other funds as far as the likes of your Farmers Relief Fund, to Tourism Relief, and a lot of others that I've covered already, including the distribution of uh, parcels by SASA. Food parcels were SASA's responsibility up to the point when they introduced the 350 uh, grant. However, there are many controls that we've identified which did not work well in so far as the distribution of food parcels are concerned. A lot of the narrative is contained in our report, and I'm sure if you read through the different sections of our report, you will get a good sense of what it is that we've picked up, as well as what it is that we recommend to be done. On the procurement side, which is one of the heavy areas where 
work continues on our side because it is this 6.47 billion that we were looking at. It is also part of the procurement with regards to the water relief. It is also the procurement that went towards schools as well as education. So if you look at the total of that in terms of procurement, in that 11 billion I spoke about, you pro you're pretty much on the procur procurement side getting close to a to total amount of about 10 billion, give or take, that would have been spent on procurement activity. And I think it's important to realize that that's largely up to the end of July, the full extent of expenditure on procurement that we are chasing. But there were a number of things that already, as we are proceeding with this work on procurement, which we have identified, some of them are clear indicators of fraudulent activity. I'll just give you one example. We then throw our tools into the database and tell our information technology scrutiny tools that are combined with forensic tests and say to them, go look for how many other activities has this particular supplier engaged, for example, the Department of Health in Gauteng prior to COVID-19. And because we are looking at somebody who gets a huge contract in the month of May or June. And we wanted to understand from a whole database, has this particular service provider been around with regards to being able to assess their track record of delivery and otherwise. And there are many of those instances that we picked up where this was just the first allocation. And so we do want to head to the list of items that the SIU and the Fusion Center are gonna need to follow up on just in case they have not picked them up directly from the stuff that they are looking at. But we want to make sure that all of that which we have identified is also added <clears throat> to their level of scrutiny. There were many instances which are contained in this report where you will find that the unit price for some of these items of PPE, whether it was uh, masks or whether it was any one of the other things that fall under PPE, some of them were bought at prices significantly higher than what National Treasury had advised. And so there's a need for that area to also be further scrutinized. From the work that we've done, there are instances of the price being 200% more, and in some instances, five times more. That's specifically the matters that we have picked up so far. As I said, the area of work in this area has not fully been uh, completed. Some instances of suppliers not having valid tax clearance certificates, I'm sure this in the Fusion Center will be of interest to South African Revenue Service because the reality is that a lot of the people, including companies and individuals that make uh, packages like these to be possible, they contribute to the National Revenue Fund. However, the ones that benefit on the expenditure side through awarding of contracts if their names do not appear on the tax system, then there's a conversation to be had around why. How does the award happen when you are not even a contributor to the very same tax system all of us contribute to? So it's a very interesting set of things that our data analytics has thrown into this whole exercise, which we believe that it is going to be very helpful uh, when the fusion center follows up in respect to the multiplicity of risks that have already been identified, which we are not yet concluding on because we need to progress them through the next stages. Areas of conflict of interest, uh, issues of inadequate or inaccurate specifications and evaluation criteria, or inappropriate application of those criteria are some of those things that our teams have already identified as well as PPE received and paid, but they were not really ordered at the beginning. So we will make sure that in our next report, which will be due so towards the end of, the, end of November, that we bring forth the follow-up work that would have been done by the multi-agency fusion center. On the area of the supply of water, I'm sure some of the difficulties that were encountered when rainwater was working as an implementing agent for the Department of Water and Sanitation are well known, but I think we do have some interesting insights and uh, findings in our report that point to some of the challenges and difficulties that were encountered 
even with the distribution of water and water tankering services. As well as the other ones which talk to the quarantine sites, the expanded public works programs, as well as uh, temporary residential units. All of these findings that we are drawing attention to in terms of this presentation are laid out in detail in our uh, main report. And finally, <clears throat> we do think that uh, having looked at all of that which has gone through the systems and monies that have been dispersed already, that this report needs to find the direct attention of all oversight bodies in the government, whether it's portfolio committees, whether it's executive authorities, whether it is uh, many of those institutions that play an oversight role. They need to take a keen interest in what is contained in this report because this report gives all of them a baseline of where we are now. But it doesn't walk away from the things that have gone wrong. They still need to be processed from an oversight point of view. But I think it is better that all of those that are charged with oversight to now gear up and put their preventative control measures in place to make sure that the remaining part of this budget does not go through similar fault lines without the leadership standing up to it. One of the examples that we have in mind, for example, if an accounting officer still has a budget, as we can see many still do, and they are planning to use this money for Project A, surely the oversight body ought to be alert up front so that they can also scrutinize for themselves whether there is adherence to the disciplines of preventative control, whether it is for procurement of goods and services or whether it is for disbursements of funds for those that are entitled to them. As well as the ongoing rigorous monitoring of the identified control weaknesses must be part of the equation because uh, COVID-19 is not behind us. Some of the real impacts of it, which might require additional resources, are possibly yet to reveal themselves. But we think that it is very expensive for our institutions to chase after all of this when we have to engage the services of investigators because they are not cheap but at the same time they take the focus away from what ought to be done towards trying to chase money from people who have got a very good idea how to hide it. We think that the preventative strategy must be what we take away from here and put in place those mechanisms. We have happily as an institution already worked on providing additional insights into some of these preventative controls. We have a guide that we have developed which focuses on specific six key areas and we are going to launch this guide next week together with National Treasury so that there's no misunderstanding as to what we mean when we say preventative controls. But uh, finally, we do think that the sentiment that was also expressed by many including in other global institutions that even in this crisis there is no way we can step away from the disciplines of transparency and accountability. And I think this report is going to give us a sense of clarity as to the areas of transparency and accountability that have already been compromised and how best can we make sure that we bounce back by using a very strong instrument that is about supervising this thing to the level where there's a minimal opportunity for those that intend to cause harm in respect of diverting these funds. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks AG. Colleagues, the AG will now take your questions. Just a reminder, the hashtag for today is AG COVID report.